President Obama is urging Congress, in his words, to do the right thing as the Senate now appears on track to hold new gun control votes after a dramatic uh, Democratic-led filibuster. Senator Chris Murphy ended his nearly 15-hour marathon once he got promises from Republican leaders that they'd move toward votes on two measures, but there are right now no guarantees anything will actually get passed. Senator Murphy of Connecticut is joining us here in the Situation Room. Senator, thanks very much for coming in. Sure, thanks for having me. Will there be two votes early next week? There will be two votes. It looks like Monday night or Tuesday morning. We'll have two votes. One on closing the terrorist loophole so that individuals who are on the terrorist watch list cannot buy guns. And the second one, expanding the reach of background checks so that they penetrate not just sales at bricks and mortar stores, but also these online sales and these gun shows where today about 40 percent of all gun sales are happening. The reality is if you want to stop a terrorist from getting a gun, you have to first make sure that those that we know have terrorist connections are on the list of those that are prohibited, but then you have to make sure that those lists are sitting not just in gun stores, but in all the other forums where those would-be potential terrorists are trying to buy a dangerous assault weapon. So there are 54 Republicans, 44 Democrats, two independents who caucus with the Democrats. How many votes will be necessary, a simple majority of 51, to pass this legislation, or 60? Well, it's a deep frustration to many of us who want rules reform in the Senate that this is going to be another 60-vote requirement. Do you have the 60 votes to pass either of these two measures? I, I think I am skeptical that we have 60 votes to pass the so background checks measure. So all this has been measure. for naught? No, I, I'm skeptical that we have the 50 votes to pass the background checks measure. 60 votes. 60 votes. But we may have 60 votes to pass the measure that makes sure that people around the terrorist watch list cannot buy guns. That is a non-controversial issue in the American public. 90% of Americans believe that if you are so dangerous that you are not allowed to fly on a plane in this country, that you probably also shouldn't be able to walk into a so gun So you think store you have the 60 votes for that? I don't know, but I know that in the wake of Orlando, there are a lot of members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, that are reassessing uh, our laws relative to the ability of would-be terrorists to get expensive and dangerous weapons prominent official has made a very public apology to the LGBT community, and that's Utah's Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox. He spoke at a candlelight vigil for Orlando victims, and his speech went viral. Cox said when he was growing up, he wasn't always nice to the kids who were gay. Listen. I regret not treating them with the kindness, dignity, and respect, the love that they deserved. For that, I sincerely and humbly apologize. There he is. Joining me right now, Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thanks, Don. It's great to be with you. Yeah. You're a 40-year-old straight man. I want to know what triggered your, your change of heart. Well, I, I wish there was one thing I could point to, but it's really been kind of a journey over the last 20 years. And, and specifically, as I've gotten to know more people from the LGBT community, uh, just their, their love, their kindness, their patience with me. It, it's amazing when you, uh, when, you, when you try to reach out and get to know and, and love someone that's different than you, uh, you find out remarkably that we're really not that different. And uh, I, I know that sounds simplistic, but it's, I, I think it's a truth, and, and it certainly has been in my life. It was dark and hot, and the bathroom was full of panic club goers. This grainy cell phone video is one of three taken by Miguel Leva, who got pushed into the bathroom when the shots began. I just remember, like, you can smell, like, the blood. There was so much blood. It was like, you can just smell it. And it's like everywhere you leaned, like, all my clothes was full of blood. My, we were sitting down and it was just like a huge puddle of blood. And then after a while, when it started drying up, it just started like to smell really bad. Though some people were crying and whispering to each other, Miguel says he tried to remain quiet and recorded these images to send to his girlfriend so she knew he was alive. Chris. The only people who are alive in the video are the people who are talking and, and moving. Everybody else is, is dead. There was about 17 of us in there only like five or six of us made it out. Had you been hit at that point? Yeah, I was shot in the foot. Yes. One point in the video, you see, it looks like people passing a glass of water. Yeah, we were passing water around because there was, there was one guy, Chris, he was choking on his own blood. So we were trying to like, you know, make him swallow them, make sure he was okay. Chris, oh my gosh, Chris. 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 
He kept asking for water, and there was other people that were shot that was just, they, they needed water and they wanted water, and it was the only thing we could think of to calm them down at that moment. So there was a sink inside the stall? Yeah. Twice, he says, the gunmen fired into the stall. As the hours passed, they tried to help one another stay calm. In constant fear, the gunmen would return. In constant fear, those already wounded would die. Stay with me. Okay. Were people talking to each other? Yeah, we were whispering to each other, trying to keep everybody quiet. Miguel was shot twice, on his right foot and his left leg. He's just been released from the hospital. He knows he's fortunate to be alive, but says he can't stop thinking of those who died beside him. So many people, innocent people, you know, just there to have a good time. <laughs> the IAAF Council was unanimous that Rusaf had not met the reinstatement conditions and that Russian athletes could not credibly return to international competition without undermining the confidence of their competitors and the public. As a result, Rusaf has not been reinstated to membership of the IAAF at this stage. The deep-seated culture of tolerance or worse for doping that got Rusev suspended in the first place appears not to have been changed materially to date. The head coach of the Russian athletic team and many of the athletes on that team appear unwilling to acknowledge the nature and extent of the doping problem in Russian athletics. And certain athletes and coaches appear willing to ignore the doping rules.